the <coughs> first thing that I would like to do is just to get your name and the correct spelling so I have that on tape. Uh, it's John B. Allen, A-L-L-A-N. A-L-L-A-N. Yeah, I'm the Irish one. And, and the, the tr uh, traditional J-O-H-N of John? Right. Okay. Uh -huh. Well, if I don't ask, they always spell it right. some unique way. Mm -hmm. well, where, now, where were you born? Were you born in Washington? Or no, I was born in Ireland. Ah. Yeah, I'm from Roscommon County. My, uh, I'm the youngest of 13 children. Uh, my, we lost seven brothers and sisters in the big flu epidemic in 1919. So in 1920, my uh, parents and I came over, and my brother, brothers and my sister, and I came over to the United States and uh, was at Ellis Island and came through there. And they got, we got to Cleveland. Uh, my, it seems my mother, I don't know anything about it anymore, uh, had relations here in the United States. And uh, she died two weeks after we got here and dad put us in an orphanage in Cleveland. And uh, he was supposed to come back, according to what little I can find out, uh, to pick us up uh, in six months and he never did. We think the British killed him because uh, he was uh, one of the officers in the original IRA. Not this one they have today because to, they didn't fight women and children, they fought soldiers. Right. So, so how old were you when you immigrated? Just a little boy. When I came here? Yeah. Uh, 19, uh, I was five. You were I five. came here. I was born on uh, July 1st, 15, and I came here in 20. Is a five-year-old? Do you remember at all as a five-year-old? <coughs> not, not, of? not too much. I, uh, I have vague recollections of my sister. I think uh, all of us were separated, primarily, because uh, back then uh, the uh, orphanage is uh, what they called orphanage. Uh, in fact, <laughs> it was called the Cuyahoga County Humane Society. <laughs> that was what the <laughs> that's what the term was for children's. That were orphans. Wow. Yeah. Huh. So uh, <clears throat> I uh, I stayed uh, in the orphanage, called the Jones home at the time, and uh, it was you know back in the days of the depression and everything. So uh, whatever we ate, we stole because we got oatmeal for breakfast and beans for supper. <laughs> that was about it. Anything else? There was a big open air market a couple of blocks from us. So. They knew we'd been swiping stuff, but you know. So was, you you could sneak from the orphanage down. To yeah, the right. Well, we went to school. You know, uh, we had re uh, they, we went to a regular public school. Uh, <clears throat> unfortunately, I wasn't always too bright. Uh, I I got thrown out finally when in the ninth grade, uh, but uh, that's neither here nor there. Uh, I ran away from the orphanage when I was 12. And uh, I uh, hopped a freight out of Cleveland and wound up in Mobile, Alabama. And I had uh, got a job uh, on a snapper boat for the Star Fish and Oyster Company out of, the, uh, out of Mobile and was out in the Gulf and the Caribbean. We'd stay out for a month at a time and come in and we'd be in and we could do whatever we wanted on the three days while they re-iced the boat, re uh, resupplied it with food and everything. And the season was, uh, that was in November. Uh, December was the last month of, uh, of fishing, so I started hitchhiking and walking up uh, the coastline. I uh, got to New Orleans, hopped a freight, and <clears throat> wound up in Miles City, Montana, 20 below zero. And I'm dressed <laughs> with a short sleeve shirt and I'd like to froze to death. And an old man in a 1914 Model T Ford picked me up. And, we, uh, he was talking. He said, are you a runaway? And I said, no, not really. He said, don't lie to me, boy. I said, no, I was in an orphanage, but I ran away from that. He said, well, I got a small ranch up here. He said, uh, if you want to work, I'll put you to work. And I showed him my hands because I was callous from uh, doing the fishing because that was a heavy job. And so uh, he had a son that was six months younger than I was. Uh, both Silas and uh, uh, Molly Jonas, and then the, the son was Ray. So I was kind of raised like a brother to him. And I stayed on the ranch. Uh, the small ranch was uh, <laughs> rather impressive. Uh, our first uh, job when we were uh, 14 was to ride the line shacks. 
and supply them with uh, chop wood for the fires, you know, because it was open to anybody that would come by and stock it with canned goods and what have you. They, uh, it took us two and a half weeks to ride it. The old man, he owned 150 sections and leased 150 from the government. So you were, you were only 12 years old when you left the orphanage? Yeah, yeah. And had to make this journey. Right. Now, now because again, kids to a certain extent, you know, they've read this a little bit, you know, yeah. that way. But in their mind, they see an adult now. You were a young boy. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, were you a big tough boy or? or? No, uh, no. You mean bully in that? No. No, but I mean uh, survival. Oh yeah, survival. Yeah. If you come, uh, I survived uh, the flu epidemic of Ireland. Uh, I survived uh, uh, seven years in, the, in an orphanage back during the depression when you, uh, you know, you had a hand me down. You never saw a new pair of pants or shoes or anything. Uh, food was. Uh, very meager, and like I say, what uh, what we want, got we stole, uh, and you know the we, <laughs> we I was I was the oldest one, so I uh, was kind of the leader, and we had a couple of the girls. It was a co-ed uh, orphanage, and uh, we'd have two of the girls talk to the clerks there while us got <laughs> the good stuff. And you said you weren't smart. Oh yeah, <laughs> well I was that way, <laughs> but yeah, survival rise. I. Uh, I've uh, learned a lot of that. Did, did you face a lot of tough, because again, a young boy and riding the rails and all that. I oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, but you know, it was, uh, it isn't like today. You can't compare today with back then. Uh, a woman back then could walk the streets at 2 o'clock in the morning and never worry about being raped. We had some once in a while, but it was so far and few between, you know, uh, it uh, it really didn't uh, even enter the thoughts. We could uh, leave a hundred dollars. We've left a uh, hundred dollar on the table in the uh, line caps. Six months later, they'd be there. Nobody taped you. It was, uh, people were uh, doors never got locked. You didn't need to. So when you were hopping trains and stuff, you didn't. They have were. They were. We had. Well, everybody was hopping them. Uh, we had. They had the hobo jungles, and. Uh, yeah, I'm. I'm going to say I, you know, it wasn't easy. I had to. I was able to do some damage to some of the uh, guys that thought a young boy was real good, you know. And uh, but that's. Uh, it was very few between, you know. And like I said, I got at least I didn't have to stay on the trains too long. And then I got up, uh, you know, to Montana, and then my life changed. And it was hard work. We worked hard. Uh, it was. Uh, I've had some very great experiences when I was a kid, like back in Cleveland. I had a friend of mine that was a schoolmate with me, uh, was Italian, and his father was one of the family members. And uh, I used to get invited over once in a while to get a good Italian spaghetti and that, you know. And I was, uh, he, we went over one day and uh, there was about five women in the kitchen, and they were all talking Italian, you know. And I could see they were upset when I was there because they didn't know just what was to do. And then this real nice-looking gentleman came in the kitchen, and uh, he was talking to him in Italian. And uh, he knew the my buddy, and uh, he asked who I was, and I uh, uh, I can't even think of the kid's name anymore. Uh, told him who I was that I was. His, classes with him. And so we got invited into the table, and it was all men, you know. And he sat at the head of the table. And I, uh, he gave me a silver dollar. I'll never forget that. Uh, and uh, later on, I found out it was Lucky Luciano. <laughs> Probably good information to get after you were there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, uh, I met I met a lot of the uh, uh, infamous t types. I knew uh, I knew uh, Yanni Licavoli and Joe English, who was uh, uh, Yanni's uh, trigger man. He was the head of the Purple Gang in Detroit. I met him through the same situation. But uh, you know that's uh, that's life. You you could meet a lot of nice people, and uh, they were nice, really. Uh, they uh, you know they were gangsters, but it was business, not family. So that was a big difference. And then 
when we were on the ranch, we like I say, we worked awfully hard. Uh, it was uh, a lot of, uh, we run about 5,000 head of cattle. Uh, we'd make trips down here twice a year. Uh, I can't think of what Auburn's original name was, but we went to the stockyards there and then to the ones in Olympia. Oh, really? Yeah, uh, we made the twice a year, once in the spring and once in the uh, fall. So did this gentleman kind of adopt you? I mean, did you become part of the family? I, oh, yeah, I became part of the family. In fact, I was, uh, he wanted to split the uh, far, uh, ranch with me. And when, uh, when we were getting close, uh, we didn't have television or anything like that. We had uh, kind of like crystal set radios. Uh, we didn't have uh, any electricity, so to speak. We had uh, car batteries that, uh, you know, we ran the uh, sets off of to get some of the news and that. And we knew that uh, war was, they were talking a lot about war coming, uh, that Adolf Hitler was in the, uh, was Chancellor of Germany and was causing, uh, he was marching against all of Europe. And then uh, we'd hear that the Japanese were uh, unhappy with us because we were unhappy with them for invading China. So war was getting pretty imminent. And uh, I was talking to Ray, and he was, uh, like I say, younger than I was. And he said, well, we should join, get in the Army and go to war. And I, I didn't know. I was, uh, he was uh, 25 and I was 26. So we uh, talked it over with uh, Silas and Molly, and uh, they said, well, uh, we're not happy about Ray going, and uh, you could do, you know, if you think it's best, uh, do that, but uh, this is your home. So on July 5th, 1941, I uh, Ray and I went to Miles City and I joined the Army. Uh, Ray did too. He was, uh, we both went to uh, Fort Knox, Kentucky for uh, basic training. And then uh, I, uh, they were just starting talking about an airborne division. So I, uh, I got real interested in that. I, I thought that would be pretty cool, jumping out of airplanes. Uh, I didn't realize the training that was involved, but it was, uh, it was interesting. So I uh, put in for uh, parachute uh, training, paratroopers. And uh, in 19, uh, I, was, I was going to take some special training at uh, Schofield Barracks in Honolulu. On, July, on December 10th, I was coming out to the coast to be there. Japan hit us the 7th, so we got uh, returned to uh, uh, the 82nd Division is the uh, grandparent of the 82nd Airborne. Uh, the 82nd uh, Division was, uh, uh, at the time, was commanded by uh, Major General Omar Bradley. Uh, we had, uh, and if you familiar with the 82nd Division, that was uh, Sergeant York's division in World War II, or in World War I. Uh, so then uh, they decided, the, uh, Congress decided that it was necessary to start an airborne division, so they made the uh, 82nd Airborne, which was the first actual airborne division at uh, Fort Benning, Georgia. And then. Uh, we went, went from there, we went to, uh, I got uh, accepted and I uh, went to jump school. Uh, was, back, was parachuting fairly new? Was this? Oh new? yeah, absolutely. The only time you saw parachuters was at county fairs where the daredevils would fly out of balloons or something, you know. So the and, technology was not fully uh, developed at this time? I mean, oh, was, <laughs> <laughs> not really. I tell you what. The, f the first shoots of the military was what they called the T-3. And uh, since I'm talking to uh, this for a uh, bunch of high schoolers, let me tell you, if it wasn't adjusted right, you could be a soprano real quick. <laughs> and that's not the mafia soprano. No, no, <laughs> no. This was the one that uh, if that was <laughs> when you, if that hit and got tight down there, you were in trouble. So where, where did you do uh, jump training then? Uh, we did it at Benning. Uh, we, uh, they'd already uh, established us as the uh, 82nd Airborne. And the backward A's that represents the insignia of the 82nd is uh, the All-Americans Division. And that was uh, the 82nd Division. That was what they were called in France, the All-American. And so uh, we t took that as uh, our logos. 
Um, then I was, uh, I, I trained with the 505 uh, Regiment. Uh, the uh, commander of the 82nd at the time, Airborne, was uh, Matthew Ridgway. He was Major General then. And then uh, Jimmy Gavin, who finally commanded, uh, was only a colonel then. And uh, they called him Jumpin' Jimmy. He loved to jump. Uh, he was uh, kind of like a daredevil. He, he free fell and uh, pulled his own rip cords out of the old biplanes and what have you. Uh, just, uh, he, he loved jumping. Uh, my CO in uh, World War II, uh, um, what was his name now? Darn it, it's just on the tip of my tongue. Anyway, he was also a uh, loved to jump. And uh, then uh, we, uh, we transferred uh, to, Air, uh, to uh, Georgia, no, uh, to uh, Fort Bragg. They, brought, uh, they activated Fort Bragg, and that was, the that was the beginning of the 82nd's home, and that's been a permanent home of the 82nd all through the career. Uh, since, we, uh, since we were at war, the, uh, we did a lot of specialized training, a lot of specialized jumping, because uh, uh, they needed, uh, they had no use right now for in the beginning of the war for us. In 1942, uh, I think it was January, I'm not sure anymore, that's just been 61 years ago. And, but uh, we, uh, we went to North Africa, and uh, we were at, uh, in a, a a little area outside of Tun in Tunisia, and we did a lot of uh, training there for because uh, they were getting uh, the the combats there, and uh, we we only got involved in two of them, uh, which were uh, mostly not German but Italian troops, and the uh, at that time the Italians uh, were under the German rule a boot so much that they were ready to give up anyway. There was not much fight left in them. But uh, the U.S. Uh, government uh, was getting ready to, uh, trying to get on the mainland of Europe, and the only place they could do it was Sicily. And so we did a lot of training for uh, uh, making parachute uh, jumps behind enemy lines. And uh, how, how did you train? I mean, did you have to they put you in full gear and go up and jump? Oh, yes, absolutely. Oh, yeah. You're... Uh, we we trained constantly in full full gear because you know we had to take it anyway, and in uh, at the time we sometimes even uh, had uh, two hundred pounds of uh, supplies hanging from our belts going down that we released just before we hit the ground, and uh, so the uh, the training was very rigorous, extremely rigorous. Did, were you doing static line jumps? Pardon. Were you doing static ones? Yeah, mm -hmm. so yeah. They hooked you up and right. Yeah, you get uh, we uh, uh, our jump, jump master would get the go from the pilot. Uh, hopefully that we were at, on our targets, and then uh, we'd stand in the doorways, and then the jump master would uh, just say go, 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 and we'd go around the uh, plane. Uh, we and hook up as we got on the one side where the doors were, and then jump. Uh, and did you, now you were excited to, to at first when you thought about, ooh, jumping sounds cool. Was it cool when you got there? Did you like uh, it? Yeah, actually, I, I enjoyed it. I really did. I, uh, I'm, I'm kind of weird anyway, at least that's what some people tell me. Uh, <laughs> my sweetheart particularly. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I enjoyed it. I really did. Uh, in fact, I made uh, quite a number of jet jumps through my career. But uh, yeah, we had to. At first, we had to pack our own shoes. That was one of. And let me go back a little bit in the beginning of the jump training. Uh, back then, uh, to get your jump wings, you had to earn your glider wings first. And uh, those uh, those gliders were death traps, as far as I'm concerned. I was glad to be out of that and get into the parachutes. Uh, so before you could jump, you had to go do the gliders? Yeah, we did the gliders, uh, and then we got our glider wings, and then uh, we got our uh, 
we, when we continue. Some guys uh, <laughs> couldn't qualify for the uh, uh, paratroops, uh, so they stayed with gliders. But let me uh, get let the kids understand uh, when we when I say 82nd Airborne, that doesn't mean just PIRs. Parachute infantry regiments. Uh, that means we had we had medic medics jump with us. We had field artillery jump. Uh, we had uh, all of the um, um, we had machinists. Uh, uh, all everything that would uh, support our jeeps, our trucks, whatever. All had to jump out of those planes. So we had uh, it was uh, it wasn't just. Uh, Infantry soldiers that jumped. It was everybody. W were you dropping gear too then? Uh, no, we we dropped. We were uh, we were uh, paratroopers. We were PIRs, uh, and that's par uh, paratroop infantry regiments. Uh, the five hundred five was a regiment. The four five hundred fourth was. Uh, there was quite a few of them, and uh, then uh, <clears throat> we trained a lot uh, with. Uh, some uh, British uh, in North Africa, uh, British paratroopers, because the assault on Sicily was going to be a bear cat. Uh, when, the, when the assault did come, uh, <coughs> the uh, I forget what division it was that uh, landed first. I think it was the third, but I, uh, I'm not really sure. But they got hung up bad. So uh, it was uh, sent down from uh, Headquarters that we were going to jump behind enemy lines at Guana, Sicily. It was uh, on the coast, and we had uh, there was about twelve pure, uh, pillboxes that had to be taken out because they controlled every movement uh, of the roads. So that was uh, one of our jobs. And uh, then uh, we uh, they <laughs> the intelligence wasn't as good as it is supposedly today. Uh, they didn't tell us that the Hermann Goring Panzer Division was there also, and we ran into that. Was and, was that your first uh, combat jump? Yeah, mm -hmm. that was the first combat actual. Uh, the one uh, the combat jumps that we had there in uh, North Africa against the Italian was really nothing. They were more or less almost like training jumps, because we didn't uh, there wasn't that much firing from either side. Uh, they just uh, lifted their cells and. Uh, they just uh, gave up. They they had no heart for it. And that was the like you said, the Italians had been under yeah. the boot of Germany. Yeah. And uh, the uh, and by that time, even the Germans were uh, getting uh, pretty fed up. The, their uh, their supplies were getting low. Uh, they couldn't get fuel, and the Panzers. Uh, Rommel was, uh, from what I understood, was uh, rather ill and uh, was sent back. Then he was put in. Uh, well, I don't want to get ahead of myself. Uh, he, uh, the Germans pretty much gave up after a while in uh, North Africa's uh, history can tell you. But uh, Sicily was the first actual invasion of mainland, uh, mainland Europe. Uh, we got uh, a lot of, uh, we lost a lot of men. Uh, the. Uh, like I say, our our leaders were pretty good, but uh, the higher commands were, you know, they just couldn't understand how to fight against different things. And so a lot of times uh, with the 82nd, we had to uh, function on our own and kind of uh, learn our uh, uh, commando tactics. Uh, we, uh, one of the, uh, uh, we had uh, one uh, colonel, light colonel. He was uh, his his grandfather was an Indian fighter, and he said uh, the, he listened to stories. So he said maybe it's time we started doing a little Indian fighting and doing some of the things the Indians did, and uh, it did. It helped uh, because you have to adapt in war. There's no you you cannot plan right out front how you're going to fight a war, because the terrain is uh, different. Uh, in uh, <laughs> Tunisia, you fought sand and, and fleece. I mean, you couldn't, uh, 
our bodies were practically raw. You'd take a shower, you'd start sweating, and you were in a, you were in a horrible shape. So uh, it was uh, actually very, very difficult to do uh, and to fight. And then in uh, Italy, or in Sicily, it was, uh, it was kind of sunny. It wasn't too bad, the weather was. Um, but uh, then uh, we got, uh, we finally ran the Germans out of, out of Sicily. There was, I forget what all divisions. I know the third was there. And I believe the first was there, but I won't swear to it. Uh, the, uh, the 101st was activated, which was the Screaming Eagles. And so uh, they were, I'm not sure just exactly where they were at that time. Uh, then we went, uh, we jumped into Milan, Italy, and got uh, uh, secured uh, the Italian uh, peninsula pretty good. Did, did you generally jump at, at night? No, no, we didn't, nobody nobody jumped at night. So you jumped in oh, daylight. Oh yeah, we didn't. Uh, no, <laughs> there was no such thing as night jumping. Now, being a novice, I see one problem here. What's that? Big white target yeah. coming out of the sky. Absolutely. So what's it like jumping into a situation like that? Uh, well, it's uh, by then we look, myself uh, was. A, getting to be a seasoned trooper. I was been shot at. Uh, I'd been nicked a couple of times, and uh, I'd, had, uh, I'd had a couple of busted ankles and that. So I was, uh, I was aware of what the situation was. But usually at that time, we were, our drop zones were pretty well open. We didn't have to worry about the Germans at that time, uh, especially in Sicily. When we landed, uh, we were fine. It was uh, when we tried to move in and hold and take those pillboxes that we ran into one hell of a hell of a fight, because the Germans weren't about to give up Sicily without it, and it was uh, it was a constant. Uh, you got uh, you could get nailed from sniper fire. The Germans had a lot of good snipers, and uh, they were very accurate in their fire. So you uh, you just did uh, and. Uh, Survived. You uh, you took cover when you had to. You uh, manipulated terrain to uh, suit your own purposes. When, so when you jumped, did you carry your weapon out with you, or did you? Just, oh yeah. Oh, so no. you did coming down. Your oh yeah, yeah. See, our shoots automatically opened from the uh, uh, when we hunt, uh, tied up, and then uh, if uh, you know parachute jumping in the early years was hell because the T3s were not easily guided. And uh, the, uh, <coughs> you, I, I was, my primary weapon was the Sub Thompson 45 caliber machine gun, uh, which most, a lot of the uh, PIRs were. Uh, the, uh, we got, uh, so we always kept our uh, guns at the ready just in case we did run into uh, enemy uh, forces on the ground shooting up. Uh, shooting up or shooting down is not as easy as it sounds. It's, uh, your trajectory is so much different. So it, uh, unless you're getting shot at from a machine gun point, you're, uh, you're pretty safe. Uh, and uh, you do, you know, I don't know if you know what a streamer is. That's uh, a chute that doesn't open. And uh, we do have reserve chutes, and sometimes uh, if that, uh, I've had several of my men uh, killed by uh, streamers. Uh, their chutes, their primary, uh, their uh, other chute wouldn't open uh, and gets tangled in the uh, main chute, the primary. So it, uh, it was very difficult. Uh, you could usually say a, primer, uh, a streamer was dead. Uh, did did you see w w when you jumped again? I only have the movie perception of the numbers uh, of parachutes. When you jumped, could you see other soldiers w close enough? Oh to yeah, you? yeah, yeah. You're. Uh, we followed each other out very closely. Uh, we would uh, when their chutes open, the wind already's taken you, and you're you're trying our our jump uh, our jump zones. 
were like the plane, here's our jump zone, the plane, we go out here so that we can glide in because the wind's going to take us one way or the other. And uh, it, uh, it, can be, uh, it can be tricky. Uh, it isn't like today where the chutes you could drop on a dime. Uh, you just uh, hope the wind wasn't too bad. Uh, you didn't get a big gust that would drive you way the hell off your course. So what was your closest to the target you were, and what was your farthest away? Uh, <clears throat> Normandy was our farthest. Uh, that, was, that was a nightmare. Uh, but uh, the, uh, I think uh, in Sicily, we, we were within a uh, uh, thousand feet of our apps where we wanted to land anyway. So it wasn't bad because the weather conditions were pretty good at the time we jumped. Uh, they tried not to get us to jump in foul weather, if possible, because of the uh, uh, you had a wet chute, you had this, you had all that, you know, and it uh, really contributed. Uh, the visibility would be bad, so we tried to jump when uh, we depended a lot on the meteorological uh, organizations of the military to give us uh, at least a halfway accurate uh, description of what the weather was like at our, where we were going to be in action. Did, did you, care, once you got down, did you get rid of your chute? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you just huh? folded them up and dropped them, you know. Yeah, you didn't want to leave them uh, out because they could, uh, you know, a gust of wind could take them and cover maybe th two or three men. And that, uh, that would be disastrous because they were trying to get out of their chutes and all that. So yeah, the minute we uh, hit and rolled, uh, we'd, unbuckle and uh, get out of the chute and then uh, just roll it up. But uh, then uh, we try to form our groups, uh, our my, uh, companies, and uh, then take care of our objectives. Uh, we had uh, demolition people with us and uh, all of that, so uh, we, we, we would try to protect them as much as possible. Uh, actually, what a, a good, I always, uh, was told that a good infantryman is fodder for everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> and so you were usually going in first. Oh yeah, we went yeah. in first. Yeah, yeah. And uh, um, and you know the uh, when uh, Sicily was secured and we went into I Italy, <laughs> it was uh, it was kind of a piece of cake, and everybody. We thought, oh boy, we're going to get into Rome and have a few days and all that. Next thing I know, we're on our way to England. They're talking about uh, Normandy. We're going to get it. We need to get into France. So, unfortunately, we went into England. And all it was was rain and fog, rain and fog. Uh, we were. <laughs> that uh, we were scattered, the 101st, the British Airborne, the 82nd, were uh, scattered at staging areas all over England. We had, uh, we, you got to realize that uh, some of the movies are true, especially The Longest Day. We had about three and a half million men stationed in England at different staging areas on ships that were getting seasick as hell. And uh, the weather was atrocious. Uh, the channel, you couldn't even see it. Uh, the uh, uh, Normandy was bogged in and rained in. It was, uh, it was a mess. They, uh, they, we went there in uh, June of 44. Or, uh, I'm sorry, in uh, um, January of 44, we went to England. And, uh, We'd uh, missed, uh, Eisenhower uh, tried to get us uh, in, in in about May, and it was just, the weather was atrocious. Uh, the Germans were suffering just as bad, because they, uh, they didn't, uh, the only one that had any intelligence about Normandy was Rommel. He was in command of the coast of, Rom of Normandy, and he's the one that built, had the German army build all the barricades on Omaha Beach. And uh, the uh, we we did uh, it. It came to that we would uh, have to be jumping at night into Normandy, and 
nobody had ever jumped at night. So in the staging areas where we were, we, we started jumping, night jumping. Scared the hell out of the England people. Uh, God, I wound up in a privy one time. <laughs> And I wasn't no rose when I came out. Uh, a bunch of, you know, they, they bunch, uh, jump, landed in farmyards. Some landed in a convent's uh, courtyard. <laughs> it was it was a mess. We were getting, uh, James Gavin was a brigadier at the time, and he was getting complaints from all, the mayors of all these little towns uh, about us scaring the hell out of the people because they, here we are coming down at night. <coughs> and... Uh, it was uh, really uh, uh, getting uh, real bad, uh, but then uh, the high command uh, with uh, was uh, got the word that uh, Normandy was the weather was clearing, so we got ready for and on June sixth. Now I had trained as a pathfinder uh, down in. Uh, in England there. Uh, the Pathfinders of the British, the 101st and the 82nd, we were going to be the first out of the aircraft and we were to light the drop zones. <coughs> we had uh, boxes about like that with uh, lights in them uh, run by batteries and a shield over it. And then when we hit the ground, we could wrap under cover and show the drop zone because they could see it from the air. Uh, it was a good plan. Just too bad it didn't work. The uh, we were when we uh, when we got over Normandy. We were the airborne was the first, the British and uh, the eighty uh, second and the hundred and first. We were the first to uh, invade Normandy. Uh, we jumped at o uh, two hundred hours and. Uh, I was F Company. I was attached to F Company at that time, <coughs> and uh, we were way off course. Everybody was off course. The uh, the crosswinds were uh, was, weren't anticipated for, and uh, my group uh, came down right in the square of uh, Marie Saint Eglise. What was your uh, initial target? Where were you supposed to be? Uh, we were about. We were supposed to be about uh, two miles from. Uh, Unfortunately, the Germans right uh, inland a little from the uh, no, uh, beaches at Normandy had flooded a lot of the areas so that if uh, paratroopers did land, they'd bog down with all the equipment. Some drowned. Uh, and then our gliders, uh, we pulled uh, gliders also, and they had to land. And uh, the British made a better glider than the United States did. Uh, they uh, Their their landings were... Uh, a lot better, although they had a lot of casualties. But our we suffered a lot of casualties on our glider people. <coughs> then, uh, when uh, I came down, uh, I could I could see the action uh, of the guys getting killed. The uh, Germans uh, they had a whole company of Germans there, and they were just firing uh, every time the guy got in sight. They were dead. It was it was a massacre. Uh, I one one of our people landed on the roof of the uh, the cathedral, and I landed about 150 yards out of the city. Uh, I got hung up in a tree, and my uh, shroud line snapped and wrapped, wrapped around my neck and uh, held me there. And I my neck was broke, so that was my career at Normandy. But uh, the uh, I know uh, the Omaha was the hardest hit. The British and Canadians and French landed at Sword and uh, uh, Gold Beach. Uh, the 29th <coughs> Division landed at uh, Omaha, and the 24th Division landed was supposed to land at uh, Utah. Uh, unfortunately, even uh, the first wave of the, the 24th got uh, got screwed up because of the heavy smoke from the artillery firing from the ships. And so they were about, oh, about a mile and a half away from there, from their project. But uh, it was uh, Normandy, don't mistake it, it was uh, one of the toughest 
battles this country has ever fought. And none will ever compare to it. Uh, the 29th, just uh, before they could get off the beach, lost over a thousand men. Uh, Utah, they lost uh, a few, but they were able to get inland pretty quick. Uh, and Sword and uh, the British at Sword and Juno were able to get in pretty good. <coughs> the uh, the Germans had heavy fortifications there at uh, Omaha, so that was where the main fight was. But once the uh, and uh, everybody was lost. We uh, we we would hook up with 82nd, 101st uh, British. <coughs> Half the time we didn't know who the hell we were going to run into, because we were at night. Uh, we uh, we just uh, you couldn't see anything, so it was uh, it was one of the uh, it was a heck of an experience. Did, did you know? Because you'd had some jumps already. Did you know coming in that this was different when you jumped that? Time? Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. So you knew you were in trouble coming down. Well, yeah. Uh, once we were out of the planes, uh, we could uh, uh, you know we could tell by the uh, winds that we were getting off, way off of our jump course. And as I say, the uh, none of the pathfinders uh, from either uh, the 505 of the 82nd or the uh, 101st or the British, uh, we were we were we were dead. We couldn't uh, we couldn't do anything because nobody was. You could see the shoots coming down, but they were scattered all over Normandy. So that was about the experience of uh, World War II for me. So how long were you stuck up? Because you got in a tree, right? Yeah, for three days. Three days? Yeah. How did you survive three days in a tree? I was tied. I was, in, I was unconscious a lot of times. I'd, go, I'd, I'd come in and out of consciousness. Uh, then uh, so, uh, I don't even know who found me. All I know is I woke up in uh, England in the hospital. So you don't remember him getting out of, out of the tree or? No, huh? no, no, huh. no. How many, um, now you jumped out of what type of plane was it? C-47. C-47. And how many shoots in a in a jump from your ballpark? Uh, about uh, 40, 50. And are these, because I know through the war everybody moved and changed in groups and, you know, who was next. Were these people you knew? I mean, had you been with them long enough? That uh, yeah, so, uh, a lot of them. Uh, I'm... I have made a. Uh, I lost some good friends in uh, Africa and Sicily, and I learned then do not make friends. So I was very. Uh, I was a sergeant at that time uh, when I ju we jumped at Normandy, and uh, I wasn't. Uh, I was real standoffish. I was. I was friendly. I was. Uh, I, I was very fair in my orders to my men, but uh, I didn't get close to them because, uh, you know, you could go crazy uh, when you lose good friends. Is that one of the hardest parts of war? Oh, think? yeah, yeah. Uh, you could, uh, you know, you, s you see uh, a good friend of yours and all of a sudden he's not there. Uh, uh, an artillery shell or a mortar just blew him to pieces. You know, you you just you accepted the fact that uh, yes, uh, you could say, uh, okay, I could get killed, but it didn't really it didn't matter to me because I had nobody. I'd already signed off uh, and told uh, the, uh, Silas and Molly to go ahead and uh, take my name off of the inheritance because I was going to make the army my career. I like I enjoyed it. I like I love the army. Uh, it had uh, it had a lot of its uh, <laughs> it had a lot of fallacies like in England like I say it rained and uh, it was foggy rain and fog and you'd, we had field kitchens and you'd you'd uh, you'd get your mess kit out there get your slop put on it your mashed potatoes would be floating in an inch of water by the time you got where you could eat the coffee uh, was uh, well I'd put hair on your chest and about five minutes later take it off. You know, it was nice and good and strong. But uh, it was uh, like that day in and day out. Uh, and we jumped at night in the rain. Uh, 
Uh, my commander was uh, Benjamin Vanderboot. He was a lieutenant colonel, and uh, he was very stern on us. He, uh, the, it was, uh, but he saved a lot of a lot of the five oh five's lives because of his, especially the second battalion which I was attached to. Tell, tell me, um, let me hand this to you. Tell me about this picture. This? Yeah. Where, 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 where are you? Where is that? Uh, this is England. This was England. This was, uh, this was F Company, uh, just before the takeoff to Normandy. And uh, these, uh, these two are the pilots, uh, pilot and co-pilot of the uh, C-47 that we jumped out of. Uh, this was the whole group. And uh, myself here. And I'm not sure where, uh, I can't even think of his name anymore. He lives in Chicago. Uh, he became an attorney. I can't think of where he is in here. But anyway, all of them are dead. They got killed coming down into Marie St. Yeah. Blaise, St. Marie Blaise. So do you remember him taking that picture? I mean, oh, yeah. I remember ta getting it taken about uh, uh, a day and a half before we, we, we jumped. And was this common? I mean, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The... Uh, the the groups that try to get together, uh, and it was uh, it was beneficial to uh, the records of the army because we uh, the army tried to keep as much track of their wounded and dead as possible. Uh, it was uh, a lot of our a lot of the sergeants' jobs. Uh, sometimes, uh, if it was areas where uh, graves registration wasn't going to get to for maybe a week, we would remove their dead tags so that. Uh, there was a record sent to the uh, to the uh, army, and they could take care of sending the telegrams of, sorry, you know, you lost your son or something. I, I look at these, and you know, the, some pretty young kids. Yeah, yeah. I was uh, I was called pops. <laughs> I was twenty six when I uh, joined the army, so I, it was uh, it was it was really good. I. Uh, I joined the army, uh, like I say, July fifth, nineteen forty-one, and I retired uh, November tenth, nineteen seventy-one. Wow. So I had thirty years, four months, and ten days. Can you remember conversations? Because oh, yeah, we we would talk. Uh, <coughs> we didn't uh, talk so much about uh, the upcoming jump. That was something that was kind of a taboo situation. Uh, you tried never. Uh, to think of anything negative. Uh, you'd think of the good times you've had in the Army. Uh, you'd think of what uh, was possibly uh, uh, some of the dumb things that you did. Uh, you know, you'd uh, think of uh, some of the beer parties you guys had or the fights you'd got into with other units, you know, that were you were stationed with and what have you. And it was, uh, being a good Irisher, I used to love a Donnybrook now and then, uh, especially if we run into Marines. The 82nd and Marines, <laughs> I mean, we're, we were literally at war all the time. But uh, we, the one thing about it, it was, uh, it was a lot of camaraderie because you, you always, after the fight, you'd hold up your buddies <laughs> and have a drink, <laughs> you know? So it that was, the movies doesn't exaggerate on the fact that Army, Marine, that there was that friendly, oh yeah, friend, friendly fire. So oh to yeah, speak. it was always friendly fire. We had, uh, you know, now there was no such thing as the Air Force at that time. It was the United States Army Air Corps, and we'd get into a good uh, deal with them. They, uh, they would. Uh, they would get uh, <laughs> to, uh, we'd, you know, we'd, we'd get into rear areas after a, a, after a confrontation. And I think the first thing we needed to do was uh, get, get rid of a lot of excess energy and uh, get the adrenaline down so we'd find the quickest way to get a fight. <laughs> if we couldn't fight it with somebody else, we usually did it between ourselves. But it was, uh, it was a, lot of, uh, a lot of fun. Uh, there, you know, you you always had uh, good moments in war. Uh, I'm a firm believer that uh, after I've fought three of them, that uh, war has never solved anything, really. 
Uh, but, uh, you know, y you can think of all the hard times in a war. And I, I like to impress on when I go to schools here in uh, Kitsap County, uh, I impress upon the kids that uh, even though there was uh, a lot of loss of life, a lot of, a lot of people injured, uh, it, uh, you still had some times that you can never forget, you know, that uh, you, uh, you see kids that uh, are uh, hurt or scared and you try, you try to help them out. Uh, you kind of, me, I was kind of a mother to a lot of them, you know, even when I joined. Uh, we had a lot of kids that wanted to quit because it was tough. Uh, <coughs> airborne training was real tough. Um, then, uh, and I thought, oh boy, nothing could get tougher. But later on, I found out that it could. But that was that's a different war. But uh, we had. Uh, I'd, I was uh, hurt a few times in World War II, uh, like Normandy, and then. Uh, I, I got uh, broken up in uh, North Africa. I broke a couple ankles and that. Uh, it was always, you could break anything uh, on a parachute jumping. A lot of uh, the men at Normandy got uh, busted up uh, landing. See, we, being in the dark, uh, France uh, has a lot of hedgerows. And uh, that was one of the main obstacles we tried to avoid. But uh, unfortunately, the, the winds weren't with us. Uh, it could scatter us. And, uh, I remember one of our majors broke his shoulder on uh, landing on a, uh, you know, a stone wall. Uh, it was uh, it was a lot of things that you couldn't uh, conceive of happening, that, but do, and that's in any war. Uh, you, you can't. <coughs> it's not set out to be <coughs> a well-planned offense or defense. You, uh, in a war, you never know what's going to happen. Uh, do, do, do you live in fear all the time? This is the hardest thing, I think, for somebody who's never been to war. I, I've never been. And uh, the, uh, You respect your fear. You don't let fear... The, the, uh, the worst thing is, uh, about fear is fear itself. Uh, it can uh, literally decapitate a person if they give in to it. What you do, you, you try to remember your discipline uh, uh, that you've learned throughout your training. Uh, and that's why I was, uh, the Army <coughs> has had a lot of discipline, especially in the 82nd Airborne and when they uh, made the 101st, activated it. It was too. It was a tough damn job. You, uh, there was no getting away from it. You, uh, your, your DIs, your drill sergeants and that, uh, if you did something, even looked wrong, drop, give me 50. And you did it. You, uh, <coughs> you know, and even back then, you tried to uh, minimize the, uh, the pain that you might be able to suffer in it. Because there was, you, somebody broke something every time they jumped. They had, uh, it, you know, it, <laughs> nothing was predictable. Uh, you could, uh, you could jump in uh, like uh, in uh, in Tunisia, in North Africa. We uh, we jumped in, and uh, five guys got trapped in uh, quicksand right in the desert because there is quicksand in the desert. And uh, fortunately, the other guys that hit on solid ground was able to extract them from that. But uh, it's you never know what you're going to get when you're jumping in. So yeah, it. Uh, you uh, you depend a lot on uh, uh, your you control a lot of your fear, uh, and then you know when you're in uh, I it always got a, I always kind of got a kick out of kids oh they they just uh, you know they got on the marksman's ranges at uh, basic training and all that and some a lot of them were pretty darn good shots I and I'd always impress upon them yeah but just remember that target's not shooting back at you. Uh, and that was one of the things that uh, was uh, we had to get over was being shot at, because that's a whole different ball game. Uh, we have uh, 
And, you know, and it wasn't just bullets that you had to contend with. You had uh, a lot of problems with uh, grenades, mortars, artillery. Uh, the artillery could drive you crazy because, you, you know, you don't know where it's going to hit. Uh, you can hear it coming in, but uh, you don't, uh, you just uh, hope you're down far enough that uh, you're, you survive it. Uh, grenades are the same way. Uh, the Germans had what we call potato mashers. And they were a very formidable weapon, but uh, you you know you just took everything into account, and uh, your discipline helped a lot, and your adrenaline you you know you'd get a hell of a dur adrenaline rush, and that saved a lot of lives. Me, it made me kind of crazy enough to <laughs> kind of enjoy it, <laughs> but. Uh, it uh, it was it was uh, it was hard on a lot of the kids, but they learned. It, uh, I uh, I had a friend of mine that was a sergeant. Uh, he was a drill sergeant, and he was a veteran of World War One. <coughs> and one of the guys asked him uh, in our that it was in our training group. He says, "Sergeant, what's it like to be in a battle?" He said. And he looked at him and he said, kid, you'll learn everything you need to know if, after five minutes if you're alive. And that really sums it all up. You just have, you survived. So all that pre-training is great and helped, but until you got there in battle. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah you, uh, nobody can tell you what a battle is going to be like. You know you're... Uh, uh, you have uh, you're going to have death on all around you. Uh, you can uh, be talking to be in a foxhole with uh, a couple of guys, and all of a sudden you talk you talk over and they're both dead. <clears throat> so you know it's uh, it's not a joyous occasion. You uh, you're doing a job. Uh, you, you're not you're not trying to be a hero or anything like that. In fact, I hate that word. Uh, you you do you you're there to do a job, and you do it the best you can. Do you go into because you touched on the fact of, <coughs> for instance, being in a foxhole and one minute talking to people and the next minute them being gone. Does your mind go to a different place? I mean, is there a, a, a do you kind of disassociate death and life and uh, uh, yeah, I uh, I learned that uh, you know I was raised on a ranch and I had we were we had deaths there we had a couple of men killed you know and it was uh, it was just part of the work you know it's uh, there's you know it's just like life itself uh, Carl you can't you could walk out the door here and get killed you know it's it's that uncertain. And you do, you just take it one step at a time. And yes, in battle, you try to disassociate yourself, but not to the point where you're getting careless. Because <clears throat> that'll get you killed. You always, uh, you always try to remember that uh, people are shooting at you and trying to kill you. And it's your job and your obligation to do the same. So, you know, it's like I say, it's not a fun thing. It's not uh, something you should really look forward to and think, oh boy, I could go out here and kill all kinds of people. And that's, you know, it's not, it's not really that that good. Was the, because I watched it again last night just to get a little refreshing, longest day. Was the comp, did they depict combat a accurately? I mean, were you that close to the enemy? I mean, some of it looked like Sometimes they were 50 yards away, 10 yards away. Oh, hell yes. Oh, God, yes. I've had hand-in-hand hand with the Germans. I've had to cut them. I had to cut a few throats, you know, take centuries out. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we, uh, yeah, I, uh, I, I'm not even aware, uh, familiar now with what my confirmed kills were in the three war. But they, you know, they were. They're nothing to brag about. Let's put it that way. It's uh, you don't uh, 
you had to do what you had to do. And yes, you get, uh, I got in hand to hand quite a bit. Yeah, uh, we've, uh, we had uh, some uh, German troops uh, try to charge with bayonets. And so you got really close to a lot of, uh, we didn't have that much confrontation like some of the uh, other uh, infantry divisions. They, uh, they had, uh, you know, they, they fixed bayonets and everything. Mostly we didn't uh, because we were, uh, we were like commandos. We, we, were, we had certain projects and targets to take out and uh, minimize. <clears throat> so that's primarily what we did. Uh, we were rangers. Uh, we were regimental combat teams. Uh, so uh, we would go in first and try to soften it up a little bit and, and then let the uh, main divisions uh, take it over from there. So were you in, what were, so, like roads and things like that? Was that some of your... Oh, yeah, yeah. We, we, we had our job at... Us, uh, at uh, in uh, Sicily was to uh, keep some roads, three roads open for the troops to come in, the divisions. And we had to not only capture them, we had to uh, maintain them until relieved. And we got relieved by the divisions that came in. In Sicily, what, were you mostly fighting the Germans? Oh, that's extensively, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's all we fought. The Italy, the Italians weren't in Sicily as far as fighting forces. There were Italian citizens there still, right. and yeah, the uh, you know uh, don't get confused. Sicily is a different country than uh, Italy is really, and uh, the Sicilians uh, were uh, a lot better fighters than the Italians were actually. Uh, the Italians, uh, I, I've always felt sorry for them because their hearts were never in it. Mussolini was uh, <clears throat> was, a, was crazy, the same as Adolf Hitler was. Uh, he thought he could get to be a big shot if he joined with Hitler, so that, and then Japan did and made it the Axis uh, power. But uh, the, uh, the Italians really, their hearts weren't in it. They, get, they gave up pretty easily once we hit the mainlands. And was it easy for you to tell the difference? I mean, you could definitely see a different attitude when you went against. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah they, uh, they, they lost heart back in, uh, you know, they joined with Hitler uh, back in uh, 39, 38. And they're, um, <laughs> the, the, by the time uh, 44, their, their heart wasn't in it. They, they gave up like crazy there in uh, North Africa. And predominantly, that's where the Germans had most of the Italians anyway. The, uh, the Germans, uh, especially the Panzers, uh, they uh, just considered the Italians fodder for the British. Huh. What, what was the, um, my mind wanders a little bit here. So let me, because there's one point where you talked about there's some, there are some good aspects of war. I mean, the camaraderie, practical jokes. Did you guys play uh, practical jokes? Uh, uh, not, uh, not on the. You know, we'd. Uh, yeah, we. You know, uh, we'd we get, uh, especially some new recruits come in. Uh, replacements. I don't call them recruits, but replacements. Uh, you'd get a couple of guys that had been on the line for six, seven months. You know, and they'd be outstanding inspection, and I would be reviewing them and checking the. Check their weapons. The guys next to him has got a bunch of sand or dirt and putting it down in the guy's barrel, and you get it. Mm, bam! There's your there's your gun. Clean it. <laughs> but uh, yeah, they uh, uh, we'd uh, you know uh, in England when uh, we were uh, at staging areas and the weather was so awful and the uh, outside kitchens, you know, the God, I mean, we'd. Uh, a lot of guys would get a cup of coffee and somebody would pour a handful of salt in it. <laughs> but, uh, or uh, we'd, uh, if we were in barracks or something, it was nothing to be short sheeted. That was one of the, that was one of the primary <laughs> things about uh, combat was if you were in a barracks, always check your bed before you got in it. 
Let me, I've got to switch tapes here.